welcome back to our continuing coverage of the 8th World Meeting of Families coming to you from the Pennsylvania Convention Center right here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And welcome to all those who have been watching our wonderful papal coverage with Raymond Arroyo and his team coming from Washington, D.C. We saw the White House and also the St. Matthews event. Another extremely eventful day for the Holy Father in just the beginning of his week, which will culminate with him arriving here in Philadelphia. I'm joined on set with Jeanette Bankovic, my co-host of Women in Grace and a Woman of Grace. And of course, right here in Philadelphia, coming up in about a half an hour, Jeanette will have the second keynote session with His Eminence, Robert Cardinal Sarah of Guyana. And yes. we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to that. We've got some wonderful guests, uh, Gianna Mola's daughter, who's going to be here, and some other guests we'll look forward to talking with later this morning as we go throughout the day. We have wonderful keynote addresses, which will be airing as we can air them in and around our wonderful live papal coverage, which, of, of course, always takes precedent. So, how are you doing today? What do you think about the world meeting of families, and what do you think how that fits together with what's happening with the Holy Father? Well, you know, it's so very important for us to have a focus on the family today because the fact of the matter is the family is under attack. But the good news is that through the gift of faith, families can be built up and encouraged today. Our Holy Father is coming to the country for this world meeting of families. It's so very important and underscores that it is faith, it is trust in God, it is this life of, of um, uh, ongoing development with our Lord Jesus Christ that helps to fortify and to strengthen. It's been a marvelous opportunity here, Doug, and, and you know, we've had the great privilege of interviewing so many wonderful people who are out there in the trenches every day striving to do what they can to build up family life. We all have that call. It's part of our apostolic mission as Catholics today. Right. In fact, people can hear the great crowds of people behind us who, yes. who came out of Mass uh, this morning. Uh, and uh, we were watching, of course, the Holy Father's visit earlier today yes. when he visited the White House uh, yes. and over there. And he talked about that he'll be traveling to Philadelphia for the Eighth World Meeting of Families yes. to celebrate and support the institutions of marriage and the family at this critical moment in the history of our civilization. Why do you think it's so critical? Well, I think it's critical because, as we see, we're in an unprecedented time. The uh, family is the central, the most most important cell of human society. It's within the family structure that we become culturized. It's within the family structure that we become socialized. It's there that we learn to live the virtues. And so it's always been an area of attack by the evil one. But today, in this fast-paced world in which we live, in a world that is driven by technology and in a world that has lost its, its cultural bearings in terms of the foundation of faith, we are adrift. And so I think that that this this reality is something that we all have got to take on and begin to move forward with. And that's with. why it's so important for us to anchor ourselves to the magisterial yes. teachings of the church in a sense uh, and, and obviously of the ministry of Peter. And that's why it's important to hear what he has to say and, and, and for so many people around the world. Because one of the things he talked about, he said with, uh, with countless people, this was at the White House, uh, with countless other people of goodwill, they are likewise concerned that efforts to build a just and wisely ordered society respect the deepest concerns and their right to religious liberty. Yes. And that certainly is something. There are people around the world here who don't have religious liberty. And certainly here in the United States, as you're alluding to, a lot of us at the Catholic Church, certainly EW10, have felt like some of the recent uh, political decisions have put our own religious liberty at risk. Well, I don't think there's any question about that. And I think that we would be burying our heads in the sand if we uh, felt as though our, our religious faith was not under attack. We don't live in a culture that supports the Judeo-Christian worldview or the Judeo-Christian ethos. We live in a time of secular humanism. We live in a time of relativism. And these, these very isms, ideologies, chip away at the foundation of religious belief, religious ideologies. And as a result of that, we are aware of the fact that we are experiencing a profound type of persecution. Right. And also, uh, earlier today at the White House, he, he made a remark about the efforts which were recently made to mend broken relationships, to open new doors, cooperation with our human family. Of course, he's talking in a lot of ways about Cuba yes. and that reproachment, but also it kind of relates, if you think about broken relationships to the yes. family, right? Yes. Well, most definitely. And again, you know, we see within the uh, day and time in which we live this onslaught of pornographic material. And I'm thinking of that in a specific way, perhaps because I spoke with somebody uh, just uh, today 
today about this problem. And we're going to be talking to a priest about that later in this half hour. Well, it's very right. important because what happens is this begins to uh, bring into a family relationship um, a type of, of perversity mm -hmm. uh, that tears families apart. As a matter of fact, this is an interesting statistic. When there is pornography addiction within a family, uh, there is a 64% decrease of intimacy between husband and wife. These are the kinds of things that, that we're aware of today. Well, it's like bringing in a third party into a marriage. It's almost turning it into an open marriage, and, that, and that's the problem. Yes. And so we're going to take a break because we've got so much ahead. We've got some wonderful guests who are very eager to join us. So stay with us. With We've got Gianna Mola and Thomas McKenna coming up, and I'm Doug Keck here with Jeanette Benkovic coming to you from the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, PA, here at the 8th World Meeting of Families. Stay tuned. Much more ahead. We are back here at the World Meeting of Families. Doug Keck here with Jeanette Benkovic, joined now with Gianna Mola. Gianna is the daughter of St. Gianna Mola and a member of the Society of St. Gianna Mola, the patron saint of this World Meeting of Families, also joined by Thomas McKenna, who's the president of the St. Gianna Physicians Guild. Welcome to both of you here. It's a great honor to have you here, and uh, especially with uh, you know, your, your mother being a saint at this point in time and what she means to so many people here in the United States and certainly of families around the world. Yes, I, I, I am so very happy. My mom uh, is the patron saint of the World Meeting of Families together with the dearest Pope, Jean Paul II. And I consider this a special grace of God I am uh, uh, so very happy also because just tomorrow will be the 60th anniversary of the wedding of my mom and my dad. It's really a very big honor for my same mom, for my family, and for all devoted of my mom in the United States and also all around the world. I think the world needs particularly my mom's testimony today, and perhaps today more than ever. Her uh, um, exemplary Christian life, her uh, sacred respect for life, her uh, courage and spirit of sacrifice, her great love for God, for the Virgin Mary, for her family, her neighbor, for my most beloved dad, for her children, till her, for her patience, and till her greatest love, her sacrifice giving birth to me. I think that all these as aspects are really a bright light, a secret grid, a great hope for each of us. Uh, you, uh, along our uh, journey to her holiness. My dad used to tell me that mom's message is so wonderful, so complete, and uh, 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 always very actual. It's a message of a mother of a family. It's a message of joy, of love. And uh, is a very simple message, but uh, at the same time, uh, a fundamental message and a universal message. You know, as you share with us about your experience of, of the reality of your mother's own life, you mentioned the word self-sacrifice. In your own personal life, how does your mother become for you a witness and an example to live those very same virtues? Yes. I can say that I think God blessed me with two same parents allowed to say this. And uh, the example of mom and dad are powerful example for me. And they help me very much during my daily journey towards the heaven. 
the lives, the lips of mom and dad teach me that the way of the cross is the right way I have to follow to be able to reach one day <laughs> enjoy the uh, paradise joy and uh, to arrive uh, <laughs> to enjoy God's sight. I know that the way of the cross humanly is uh, the more difficult to follow, but uh, I think is the only way that allow us to give a complete sense to our life. Moms and dads lives teach me that the way of the cross is also the way of the joy, the true joy, the more profound joy, and the prelude of a bigger joy, the joy to, <laughs> to enjoy God's sights one day and forever. And uh, if we have God in our hearts, and if we see all happens, everything happens in our life in the light of faith, even if we walk in the way of the cross, we can live in the joy and we feel in the duty to thank God for everything, for our single breath. This teach me my mom's and dad's life. You know, it's impossible for me to sit beside you and not comment on the fact that you bring tears to my eyes. And the wisdom that you have, I know, comes from your close relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, with the Trinity, with our Blessed Lady. But I also think your mother is such a profound intercessor. And within the communion of saints, your relationship with your mother exists. What is it like to ask for your mother's intercession, she now enjoying the beatific vision? Yes, I can say that I've, since mom gave birth to me, I always feel mom very close to me. And uh, after mom, as you know, died my little sister Mariolina at only six years old, two years after my mom. And my dad suffered a lot. And. Uh, <laughs> After my dad's death five years ago on Holy Saturday, I feel mom and dad and my little sister always very close to me. <laughs> they, uh, um, they always protect me and uh, I always pray to them and I know they listen to my prayers and I live with the joy and the hope to be able to embrace them one day and forever, not to live anymore. Now you must hear from people all over the world who, who have correspondence with you, who tell you about they're praying to your mother. What, do you, what kind of impact does that have on you? What do you hear from people who are relying on your mother's intercession around yes. the world? Yes, yes. I, I am always very moved and very touched when I come to know about graces received uh, through my mom's intercession. And uh, this grace are more and more every day. <laughs> I can say that moms with her life and her death gave praise and glory to God. And she gone to give praise and glory to God through her powerful intercession. And uh, to, tomorrow I will have to take my testimony in the session of infertility. In the first time, it was, I was very surprised why I have to take my testimony just in these sessions. <laughs> then I had thought, Divine Providence is giving me a very important possibility to give, to praise and give glory to God. More I reflect about this, I thought, of course, the most frequent grace of mom is just this, to be able, through her intercession, uh, to be able, <laughs> Um, the, uh, to be that uh, married couples who are not still able to conceive uh, and perhaps they are married uh, already uh, since uh, seven, nine, thirteen years uh, through her intercession around the so awaited gift of a child, uh -huh. the divine grace of a child. And I am so very happy and I thank God with all my heart and my, my, my saint man for her intercession. 
something. As you as you continue to give testimony to your mother, do you discover that God's grace is active within you, bringing about that sense of joy? I see it in you. You radiate it. Yes. I am a geriatrician, but I leave my work um, on tw 2003 to take care of my dad. And uh, now, after my dad death, uh, I I don't. Uh, uh, um, I, I don't uh, start again my profession because yes. I dedicate, I choose to dedicate my life to spread out the devotion of mom and to know also my dad. And uh, uh, I became serene because I have uh, uh, realized that I, I can do some good for my neighbor also in this way. One of the things we want to do before we have to let you go, Gianna and maybe Thomas, we talk about how some of us out there and people out there can help and support the work you're doing already. Uh, we've got some information on this. Maybe one of you would like to talk yeah, about this project. This is project. something that uh, Gianna's family asked me to, uh, to help on. We're coordinating it here in the United States. But it's a restoration project for what will be eventually a shrine to her mother. There are pilgrims coming from all parts of the world. And because the, that, this is the house, the picture there, is where St. Gianna lived after she was married. It's where her children were born. And it's where she died. And the house has been abandoned for 25 years. The owners of it now, the factory, where her husband worked is willing to donate it to the archdiocese to make an official shrine of the universal church but it lacks funding and with the situation in Europe so we've started the Pont Nova restoration project here in the United States I'm coordinating that and we have, if people would be interested to contact us to know more about it if they would like to um, to is there a web address or something we can they give can people? come to my Saint Gianna Physicians .org. Okay. It's a, it's the my organization, but we're working closely with her for now. That's that's where it is. So Saint Gianna Physicians with an S. Dot org. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We're out of time. This is wonderful. We could spend the next two hours yes. talking with you, and uh, I, uh, you know you're going to have to let her hand go sometime. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Gianna. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for having us. And. Uh, Thank you for your witness, and we look forward to your talk. Uh, back after this short break, we'll be with Father Sean Kilcauley. We'll talk to him about Covenant Eyes. We're here at the World Meeting of Families. Very powerful discussion live from the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm Doug Hex. Stay with us. Much more ahead. back to the World Meeting of Families, coming to you from the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, we're just recovering from that powerful uh, discussion we had with uh, Gianna Mola. And now we have another interesting discussion. Theological Advisor for Integrity Restored is Father Sean Kilcauley. And we're talking about the Covenant Eyes program that's used to deal basically with pornography. And Jeanette, earlier you were talking about in the opening uh, part of the show yes. about that uh, that whole issue and here we are talking about it and I guess the question is uh, I guess the question is it fits perfectly into the family unfortunately I mean you'd think years ago you'd say well you got a world meeting of families going to talk about love and what, if, what are we talking about pornography for unfortunately we have to right right when I um, when I started this work my intention was not to focus my ministry on freedom from pornography I went to the John Paul II Institute in Rome. I came back. I wrote a chastity curriculum for our high school. I was really excited about it. And within a couple of weeks, I realized that I was teaching a chastity program to a bunch of high school kids that all have access to pornography every day on their phones, on their iPods, on their iPads, in their houses. And so I had to step back and make a decision that I need to start helping parents to protect their children from pornography online. And that's really been the focus of my own pastoral work in the Diocese of Lincoln. You know, I'd like to ask you a question, Father, because I think it's very important. We know what the effects of pornography are on family life. We know what that does to a couple right. within the sacrament. But I think that that, that um, deleterious effect begins prior to entry mm -hmm. into marriage. So when you talk about helping young people to uh, uh, abstain from pornography, to uh, not um, become involved with it, it, it's one of the chief 
ways that we can to restore you know, right. truth and love and, and all that God desires for us within the marital covenant. Right. The, when I started doing this work and I started really asking guys questions, you know, what I discovered was whether somebody is 50, 15, or 11, they all were exposed to pornography for the first time when they were 10, 11, or 12. Really? And they were all accidentally exposed. Either a friend showed them a magazine, they found something somewhere, they found things under their parents' beds. Um, everybody has the same story, which is, I found this thing, which was super exciting, but also made me feel kind of gross and violated. And I didn't know what to do with that information. And typically the pattern would be exposure and then kind of going back within a month and then going back continually. And what's happening in families is our young kids are getting exposed on accident and now the rate of exposure is much higher because of technology. It's just not the same as it was when I was growing up. And then it creates shame and they're withdrawing from their parents. And the parent might be standing there thinking to themselves, well, why is Johnny you know, so quiet? And why does it seem like there's something going on here? There's a distance starting to show up. And he's afraid to bring that forward because of his own shame. And even if his parents would be very merciful and kind and loving in that moment. Um, and so that's why I promote Covenant Eyes because it's really software that helps everyone to know that nothing we do online is anonymous and nothing we do online is a secret. In a sense, it's like the way our life actually is, which is exactly. that ultimately God knows everything we're doing. So it's not like as much as we think we're doing this on our own or we're getting away with something, it is, and we all know with the internet, it never dies. I mean, if you put stuff on the internet, it never goes away. Exactly. I think some of our political leaders are finding that out, uh, albeit a little late for them. So this is a program that parents can use to filter information, but also, is it also used in such that it gives you a log so there's an accountability kind of thing with it? Right, so Covenant Eyes can be set up at different filtering levels, which is another reason why I promote it, so that a five-year-old is filtered at a different level than a 13-year-old at a different level than an 18-year-old. And so parents can actually teach their children virtue and give them different boundaries as they're growing up. Uh, sometimes I've had people who had really locked down boundaries their whole life in through high school and then when they got to college with no boundaries and they hadn't developed the virtue, they ran into a lot of trouble. And so it's a way of, it's a way of watching over and protecting. But it also is a way of teaching us that the internet isn't a place where we hide from each other. You know, it's just, I like to say, it turns your internet connection into a party line. Right? When we had party line phones, the yes. neighbors can listen in. <laughs> with Covenant Eyes, mom and dad always know what I see. Yes. And parents might have a conversation with their five-year-old and say, hey, I saw that you were watching Dora the Explorer online this week. How was that? That five-year-old will be so excited that mom and dad are interested in what I do. And also, subtly, they'll learn that nothing I do online is a secret. You know, and that's a very important thing. I'm, I'm thinking of, of the consistent teaching of the church uh, underscored so beautifully by St. John Paul II when he tells us that there is no such thing as a private sin. Mm -hmm. that all sin has a social impact, that all sin has, has an effect far beyond what we can even begin to imagine. And I love the name of, of Integrity Restored because sin disintegrates. Okay. Pornography disintegrates us. You talk about the right. fact that a child withdraws from parents. That's a disintegrating reality. Does Integrity Restored also help individuals who have become addicted to pornography regain sobriety in this area? Yes, yeah, so through blogs, right now through blogs, but what we hope is that we'll eventually have a find a local therapist list, how do I find a 12-step group, um, how do I start a group, an accountability group within my parish. And so if you go to Integrity Restored, you see that there's a section for individuals who struggle, for spouses, who I think are the most underserved population in the church right now, yes, I would have to agree uh, for parents on how do I protect my children and build an atmosphere of trust in the family, and also for clergy. So in the clergy section, we want to build it out more, but we have sample homilies, examples of how do I start addressing this in my parish right now? Because it can be overwhelming. It touches every aspect of our lives. 
Um, now, Father, you're with the Family Life Office actually in the Diocese of Lincoln, right? right? Okay. Now, is this something that's just in Lincoln and being put out to, the, to parents? Is this something you're promoting uh, to the parishes there? Are you reaching out to other dioceses around the country? How is it open? How is it progressing? So, two years ago, I started by doing some parent workshops, and then I developed a relationship with the Covenant Ice, and then um, they started inviting me to conferences. Um, and as people, as I've networked with people, and I reach out to people like sex addiction therapists that are secular, um, different family life offices, safe environments offices, um, I'm starting to do a lot more collaboration with other dioceses because we're all looking for an answer. I think we all know this is probably the biggest impediment to evangelization in the church right now. That's a big statement. Who would have thought? And, um, and I have found in my own small pastoral experience that by addressing it directly and bringing people to healing, it is the most joyful thing in my priesthood. When you see the lights go on in somebody's eyes that hasn't felt their emotions in 10 years, it is amazing to see what our Lord does. Now, Paul, you know, we're, we're just about ready to go to the main hall for the next keynote session, and so we wanted to make sure you got your web address and information out there if you'd like to so get it So Integrity Restored is just www.integrityrestored.com where you can find lots of information touching on different aspects of pornography and pornography addiction, how it affects us. And if people want to look at Covenant Eyes, it's at www.covenanteyes.com. And if you use the product code Lincoln, you can download it, you get it free for 30 days. And I would encourage every parent to try it for 30 days. And if they don't like it, I always tell my parents, call me and I'll recommend something else to you. But as long as we start really preventing those early exposures, I really believe we can change the culture. Are we dealing to some degree with a level of denial as well? Many times with parents who would think, well, well, this couldn't really be going on with my child, almost like the way in, in many cases, whether it be sexual activity or, or the use of drugs. I think there can be a level of denial, but I'd rather say that there's just a level of ignorance and a level of shame. Um, uh, sometimes we want to believe like this is just a moral failing, um, but more and more experts will say, and I think Dr. Kaponis would agree with me, that when a child is exposed, it creates a trauma in their life, you know, and they need to be responded to as somebody who's been seriously wounded and violated, not as somebody who broke the Sixth Commandment. And John Ed has had uh, Dr. Kaponis on many time times on yes. their program. And, I, and so. I do want to mention that we have Dr. Kaponis' book available at EWTNRC.com. So it's great. very important for people to get people the resources they need. Well. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So let me ask you going forward, uh, do you see it getting better or do you, because people are responding to the issue or do you see that the more you're involved with it, the, the, the worse of a wildfire it appears to be? Uh, going forward, I see it getting better. But when things get better, like when did the world get better when Jesus went to the cross? <clears throat> you know, so, um, but what I've seen is that when I work with people who are struggling with addiction, it trained me to preach the gospel more effectively. Like it trained me to be able to proclaim the love of Christ into the heart of somebody who doesn't believe they're lovable. And, and the church needs that for everyone. You know, there are many people in the church who don't believe God loves them. God loves everybody, but maybe he only loves me because I'm part of the everybody. You know, and if, if that's the starting place, we have to really like, proclaim our Lord's love, our Lord's faithfulness, our Lord's trustfulness, trustworthiness. And, um, and that starts to open people up to the healing that they need. And, um, and I really think I'm excited about the group of people who are working in this area. Um, I'm really excited about people that I've been blessed to collaborate with and, uh, and excited about parents who really are on fire to get the tools that they need. Now, I'm wondering as well, because we're talking in a sense about young people, but is this also something a husband and wife would use as well between the two to give each other accountability? Certainly, it, I, I wish I could say it was only the men, but apparently there seems to be a trend even in the other I direction. The accountability right? about how we spend our time is really important. Right. Um, every husband has a right to know how much his wife's on Pinterest. She should know how much he's on his fantasy football. Yeah. And, uh, and accountability in marriage is 
it's necessary for intimacy. Well, thank you so much. We're going to go right to the hall. Thank you, Father Sean, talking to us about Covenant Eyes. We take you to our keynote session, and it's given by His Eminence Robert Cardinal Sarah. World Meeting of Families is where we're at, and we'll go right now to the hall. Brothers and sisters in Christ, first of all, I would like to express the, the pleasure and joy to be here at this World Meeting of Families. I thank God for the grace and the honor to be invited and asked to speak on the light of the family in a dark world. It is not an easy task, but in the name of the Lord, I will try my best. I will immediately start with my first point, the goodness of God's creation. God is love, and he who is infinitely perfect and blessed in, his, in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. God's creating act unfolded between two symbolic moments. The first moment is when God creates light from the formless void of the earth and the darkness of the deep. God said, let it be light. The light creates a brightness it, it enables us to act, to encounter, to know what and who is before us and to love. Darkness, on the other hand, hides and encourages evil. We cannot see where our life is going, what is good and what is evil before us. God commands light to break into the world in order to bring order out of chaos, light, light out of darkness. The second symbolic moment, the pinnacle of God's visible creation, concerns the human person God says, let's make man in our own image, in the likeness of ourselves. What is the image and likeness that we find in the divine? At the core lies relationship. God's own word, let's make, reveals a plurality of persons which sacred scripture shows to be the Trinity, one in nature, yet a distinction of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who live in perfect unity. In this distinction and perfect unity, we find the nature of God, who is love, perfect charity. Distinction necessarily means the gift of self to the other, a relation and openness. It implies otherness. Only love, perfect charity, can create unity like this. 
God, in his deepest mystery, is not a solitude. St. John Paul II says, God is a family. He has in himself fatherhood, sonship, and the essence of the family, which is love. God is love. God is like a family. Indeed, man was created for fellowship with God and also other human beings. God made the first woman because it is not good for man to be alone. Man and women are being created as the first human family, equal in dignity, complementary in relation, and each is called to make a gift of himself or herself for the other in imitation of God himself. The relation the relationship with God and our fellow human beings is called to reflect the very life of the Trinity. Distinction in perfect unity through the love that the three persons, fathers, son, and Holy, Holy Spirit have for one another, a love whose trace we bear by being created in the divine image and likeness, a love that is fruitful, go forth and multiply. The fall from grace. The first 11 chapter of the book of Genesis want us to understand how darkness slowly seeped into, into, into the goodness of God's creation, rupturing human relationship to God, to the one another, and the natural world. We begin with the story of the fall. Adam and Eve broke their relationship with God by disobeying his command not to eat of the forbidden tree, they commit an act in which they say amen to the catechesis of the devil. You, you will be like gods. The heart of the devil's lie is this. God wants to limit you. He does not want to see you, your life, fulfilled, so fulfill yourself as you decide best. Why put limits on yourself? The act of eating is a sign that Adam and Eve accept this catechesis. It is what we call the original sin. Sin generates death, not only physical death, but ontological death too, the death of being. Man exists in so far as God gives him being, and God gives him being by loving, for God is love. If we accept through sin, that God is not love, we deny that God loves us, and we separate ourselves from, from him. Our life loses its meaning, for we are, all, we are alive only in so far as God gives us our being out of love. This is confirmed when you continue reading from Genesis. 
Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. The feeling of nakedness is the sense of this death of being, which is the absence of God. Adam and Eve experienced death, which they did not know before. For this reason, they hide from God. They begin accusing each other. Separation from God, consequently, is also a separation from one another. The first human relationship begins to disintegrate. This is what sin does. Sin leaves us weakened. Since we believe that God does not love us, we begin to seek life everywhere, money, fame, power, and pleasure, believing that these idols will fulfill us. This is the great deception, because the more we seek life and love in these things, the more we become enslaved to them. This is the work of the, will, of the evil one. We fulfill ourselves. Our lives have meanings, and we find happiness in relating to the other, loving God and neighbor, the greatest of the commandments. But when we sin, we choose to cut ourselves from the love of God and are unable to love, pass to the other, and live a virtuous life. Even if we know the goodness of life, we choose death. This is the spiritual battle that St. Paul so poignantly describes in his letter to the Romans. The fact is, I know nothing good with living in me, in my natural self, that is. For though the will to do what is good is in me, the power to do it is not. The thing I want to do, I never do. The thing which I do not want, that is what I do. But every time I do what I do not want to, then it is not myself acting, but the sin that lives in me. Darkness envelops humanity. This is the condition of every man and woman. Original sin is like an uncontrollable and enveloping disease that we have inherited from our first parents. Following on from the description of the fall in Genesis 3, the subsequent chapters present the progressive fall of humanity, the scene of mankind. As a consequence of man separating himself from God, man se separates himself from man. Cain murders his younger and innocent brother, Abel. This episode introduces the bitter reality of violence and bloodshed between brothers. 
This violence progressively spirals out of control until the whole of humanity is totally submerged in evil, in sin, and death, signified by the wild and watery deluge of the flood to the point where humanity is walking straight toward destruction with the Tower of Babel. Its construction with its top in the heavens is a proud attempt to storm the divine through a proud field and man-made unity that is hostile to God. How sad it is that in seeing weakness, weakness on earth and how every thought in the human heart continually turned to evil, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, something that grieved him to his heart. In front of all our sufferings on a personal, family, and universal level, breakdowns in relationships, interpersonal strife, rooted in envy, anger, or hatred, moral problems from addiction to abortions, religious persecution and terrorism, if we do not go to the source, which is sin, nothing changes. Sin is the result of all our troubles, all our sufferings. According to the letter to the Hebrews, we are held in slavery for the whole of our lives through the fear that we have of death. Sin creates a deadly boundary which encircles everyone who sins. We are unable to open up to the one who goes against me. We cannot reach out and transcend ourselves in the other person. The experience of death, which possesses us, stops us loving at the moment when someone else is felt to be destroying, killing, and repressing. If this situation is not broken out of, we cannot fulfill the law of God, love of God and neighbor. Here we understand the root of so much broken down in the God-given understanding of the family at the beginning of creation. The darkness that has entered contrary to his plan of the love and unity found in the Trinity, people even of the same sex joining themselves randomly and provisionally at, at will, cohabitation, fear of openness to life, abortion, separation and divorce, an unwillingness to care for the wicked family members, such as those who are sick or old. In a vast area of a world that has forgotten God, where in the word of Pope Benedict XVI, in which the faith in many places seems like a light in danger of being snuffed, off, snuffed out forever. Laws are passed that fuel this breaking down from those fibering, killing innocent life in the womb to a new form of union, to euthanasia, 
and assisted suicide. Even members of the church can be tempted to soften Christ's teaching on marriage and the family and acquiesce to varying degrees. The idea that would consist in placing the magisterium in a pretty box and separating it from personal practice which could <laughs> the idea that would consist in placing the magisterium in a pretty box and separating it from pastoral practice, which could involve, according to circumstances, fashions, and impulses is a form of, of heresy, a dangerous <laughs> a dangerous schizophrenic pathology. And this is precisely why we need Christ. Each of us need him. Every person on earth needs him. St. John, in the beginning of his gospel, reminds us all things came to be through him, and without him, nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life. And this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Repentance and kerygma. The book of Genesis is not just a story. It is our story the story of every man and woman. So today, at this word meeting of families in Philadelphia, I extend an invitation. In this moment, enter into your heart. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the Tower of Babel, are they biblical names of a nation distant past? Or do they speak of me and my present life? Indeed, in the word of Pope Francis, when we begin to look at what we are capable of, and we ask ourselves, Am I capable of doing this? Capable of speaking ill of another and morally killing him? I have to ask myself, am I capable of it? Yes, I am capable. Yes, I am capable of sin. I am a sinner. But God, rich in mercy, when we were dead because of our sins, he brought us to life with Christ. How beautiful are these words of St. Paul. In front of our sins, in front of the tragedy of sin, God puts a limit intervenes with his merciful love, his son and his spirit. This is why repentance is good news. The acceptance of the roots of sin within our hearts 
is wisdom. It is the beginning of a journey of healing, the healing of man and woman, the healing of the human family, and make us really and makes us ready to receive the good news, to welcome the mercy of God. Yes, the mercy of God as a gift from God, as God's work in our life, a new work of creation. I believe humbly, Pope Francis says, that this is the most important good news of Christ, mercy. What a grace it is for the church and all of humanity that Pope Francis has called the Holy Year of Mercy. The joy of the gospel is the joy of mercy. This mercy has a body, has a name, Jesus Christ, who on the very same mountain where Isaac was spared, willingly carries the wood of cross and mounts that wood. Love to the end and mercy are the judgment on our sins, the free gift of Christ's passion, his cross, the, resurrec the resurrection, the ascension, and the death and descent of the Holy Spirit, a historical event that, break, that breaks into the, our existence today and the personal situation that we are facing, changing us radically. New life is possible only in so far that as a new man is coming into being, filled with the Spirit of Christ, given through the, a personal encounter with him. This is the charisma that Pope Francis speaks of on his apostolic exhortation, Evangelium Gaudium, the joy of, of the gospel. The charisma contains three basic elements that offer us this new life. First, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The initiative is God's. Seeing our condition from the moment of original sin, God does not remain indifferent. He sent his son into the world so that we might see again what we are called to. God's will for us is that we share in his own divine nature, he who is love himself. This is what the fathers of the church refer to as admirabile commercium, the wonders exchange. In becoming incarnate, assuming a human nature to himself, God grants to us in return a participation in his otherwise inaccessible divine nature. In the word of St. Irenaeus of Lyons, Deus homo factus est, ut homo fiere Deus. God became man so that man could become God. Second, Jesus' passion accomplishes this mission 
of offering us divine life. St. Paul tells us that death entered the world through sin. Hence, you and I are subjected to death because of our sins. Yet, we do not die since Jesus takes our place. Not only that, Jesus effects a union between God and humanity on the cross by pouring out his spirit on us when he breathes his last with words pointing to the eternal covenant of marriage, consumatum est, it is consummated. In the baptism, we too receive in our lives this same life-giving spirit who raised Jesus from the dead and raised us from the death, drawing us out of darkness, of original sin, and into God's light. For this reason, the early church called baptism for Tismos, illumination. God's indestructible life comes also to us, a life that is nurtured lifelong in the church, especially through listening to the word of God, the sacramental life, and supporting one another in a community of faith. Third, by rising from the tomb, Jesus opens the heaven for us. He carries into the bosom of the Trinity our humanity, which he knows in all of its depth, having himself descended into hell. Now in heaven, Jesus intercedes for us before the Father in all our needs. Together, Father and Son, send into our hearts the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. Love to the end, the sign of faith. This Spirit, the Holy Spirit, agent of charity, love to the end, is the gift offered to us to face and overcome all that seems humanly impossible within the family and the old relationship openness to life, faithfulness in marriage, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, care for the sick, care for sick and disabled, remaining close to our elderly, forgiving the one who injures. This is the love revealed and freely given by Jesus in his passion, caritas, a sacrificial, self-giving love that makes a person go out of himself to love God and neighbor to the end. By rising from the dead, Jesus Christ has broken the circle of sin and death, which keeps us enslaved and close off the path to love the other. So thus freed, we can pass through the barrier which separates us from the other and love them. It is a love to, to the end, love in the dimension of, of the cross, love to the enemy. This is the light that overcomes every darkness in family life, so often 
overladen in this world with division, pain, and the cross. To love the other when he or she is different to me means to overcome death. We pass from death to life through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not moralism. God's grace comes before one's duty. We reply to a divine initiative. All those wounded by personal sin and the sin of others, the divorced and separated, those who have cohabited, who lived closed in on themselves or in all kind of self-seeking unions can and must find in the church a place for regeneration without any finger being pointed, pointed at them. This is the testimony that the Christian family is called to give. Love to the end is possible. Jesus told his disciples that others would come to know him through a concrete sign. Just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this love you have for one another, everyone will know that you are my disciples. The family and every Christian is called to make such love to the end visible. Thus calling others to believe. In the early church, no believers were called to faith by the witness of the first Christians, even into death, see how they love one another. This love is stronger than any darkness. As Jesus in the Eucharistic sacrifice to be given out, poured out for the other through the grace of the risen spirit of Christ who overcomes every kind of barrier. The Christian family, wellspring of faith, hope, and love. The family then becomes the first evangelizer. By its vocation, Pope Francis writes, the family is meant to, to, to spread its love to the world around it. The family is the wellspring of faith. Faith needs a place where it is gestated, transmitted, where it can grow, where it can become a lived experience. From the start of creation, God chose the family as this place. He created the family as the place that would speak of God, that would praise God of his fullness, fruit, fruit, fruitfulness, Adam and Eve, of forgiveness and brotherhood. Cain and Abel, of salvation of form sin, the family of Noah, of faith, Abraham and Sarah. In the family, the promises of God become real. The family is the living memory of the fidelity of God. The family is the wellspring of hope. The family directs itself and looks always towards the future. The family carries 
in itself the future. It is custodian of our future, the future of humanity. Within a, within a family, parents are custodians of children, and in time, children will become custodians of their aging and sick parents and grandparents. The future needs not, do, not look bleak, for in the family, hope in the future is built, becoming also a sign for the rise of humanity. The family is the wellspring of love. Perfect love or charity is relationship as we see in the very life of God. Three distinct persons who live in perfect unity. The family is called to live this mission as relationship. Husband and wife, parents and children, grandparents. In the family, we learn to relate, to love, to serve one another. We become like God through relationship of self-giving love. Marriage, openness to life, defending the dignity of life from the first moment of conception to its natural end, care for the, for the weak and elderly, the family becomes the place where solitude, selfishness, egoism find healing, where we become decentered person and another becomes the center of my life. Living examples. The world today needs sense with heroic witness to defend and nurture the family. By opening ourselves to God's grace, His Holy Spirit living in us, our homes and families can allow goodness to enter the world. Allow me to finish my address with a moving yet beautiful example of how the witness of the Christian family can bring light to even the greatest of darkness. It concerns September 11, 2001, the day of the Twin Towers massacre in New York and the true story of a family in the United States. Frank Palombo, his wife Jean, and their 10 children. The youngest, Maggie, who was just one at the time, and the eldest, Anthony, 15 years of age. A very Catholic family for sure. In an interview, Jean recounts how she woke up worried that morning because she thought that she was pregnant. I told Frank, I cannot again so soon. I'll go crazy. Frank answered me, do not worry about that. But what will we call him? I start to laugh. He always knew how to make me laugh. Frank never returned home that September 11 in 2001. He was a New York firefighter who alongside almost 3,000 other victims gave his life in the terrorist attack. 
in an interview given less than two months after 9-11, Jean recognizes that their marriage and family life was not always idyllic. 70 years, 70 years ago, I had left the church. I did not want any children. My marriage was breaking up little by little. But then, through a missionary outreach in their parish in New York, something changed. I witnessed Christianity in a missionary couple who were expecting their fourth child. They had left everything, home, careers, country, to proclaim the gospel. I thought, God loves me so much that he has inspired in, some, in someone this desire so that I could hear the gospel, the good news. Asked, asked about the, her feelings after the Twin Towers tragedy, Jean said, I miss Frank terribly and I cry a lot, but I know that he will continue to help us from heaven. She added, I think that God works for the good of those who love him. This event has been a great evil, but God's love has exceeded this evil. Frank transmitted faith to the children and they often console me with a word. When I think of the terrorists, I can only say, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they have done. Sure, I'm afraid, but I cling to the, to the Lord. My children and I need to continue in the church doing God's will. Five years ago, at the age of just 49, Jean, already a young widow with 10 children, was diagnosed with cancer. Jean died a little over two years ago her eight sons carried her coffin into the Cathedral Basilica of the Sacred Heart in New York, New Jersey, before 2,000 people and some 30 priests. Maggie, now 15, was asked by a neighbor why she seemed so much at peace and she answered, because my mom is in heaven. I know she has complete joy. What more could I want for her? Maggie's many brothers and sister are taking care of her today. Thank God for large families. Anthony, the eldest son, and now 29, served at the funeral mass. He's the father's self-giving witness as the father of 10 children, a firefighter, but most of all, a man of faith, surely inspired Anthony to enter the seminary.
in the coming year, Anthony will be ordained a priest. This is the story of reversal. Evil does not have the last word. God brings good from evil. This is how God has worked from the beginning of creation. God is not overcome by evil. He overcomes evil with good. In the face of all the challenges of married and family life, Frank and Jean Palombo, a young married husband and wife in the United States, were granted the grace to love selflessly to the end, first by repenting, then receiving and believing in the kerygma, the good news. The faith with which they lived and their children still live instills hope in us that we too can bring the light of the gospel into our world, putting flesh on the words of St. Paul. May you be strengthened with power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. May Jesus Christ be praised. Amen. And there we have it. That is, in fact, the uh, keynote address by Robert Cardinal Sarah, uh, who we just heard. Uh, I'm Doug Keck here with Jeanette Bankovic, live here at the Convention Center in Philadelphia for the World Meeting of Families, the eighth World Meeting of Families. And uh, I was going to, interesting because, uh, uh, Jeanette, because Cardinal Sarah has uh, got a wonderful new book th yes. that's out. Uh, I've been reading God or Nothing, A Conversation on Faith. And it's a wonderful book available through the catalog, and people should check it out because he has some really, really powerful things to say. It's like you've read it well. Yes. It's highlighted, dog-eared, and everything right. else. It's a wonderful things. And of course, you said some wonderful things there, I think, about the family and relating to, uh, I think, the strong aspect of the family that we see coming out of the African church, which is a, a great support for the West, which I think, as he talks in here, has somehow maybe dropped the ball a little bit on the family side. Well, it's very interesting because the reality is that we used to send missionaries to Africa, but now missionaries are coming to the United States from Africa, and it's encouraging to see how the church is growing. Exactly. And we're getting a lot of sound now from the room out there. You can hear as the uh, main session has ended. And we're welcoming some new guests right here uh, to our set. And first, we've got the president and founder of the CatholicSingles.com, David Navarez, and his lovely wife, Tricia. And we also happen to know that you two guys actually met online, right? Absolutely. Yes, we did. <laughs> so I have a question for you, sure. Jay. Did you build the site just so you could meet your wife? <laughs> Um, many would say so, <laughs> but you know, in the beginning, that was one of the reasons that came to mind. You know, I I was single, uh, one of the few people online that I knew in my close circle of friends, and didn't have uh, 
a big pull to date from at that point, at getting out of college. So a little light went off, I guess, and the Holy Spirit kind of pushed me in this direction. So, you know, eventually uh, I met Trisha, which 14 was... 14 years later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, but in the beginning, it was very much, you know, hands off. I just worked on the site and had another job and I was just doing this and not really didn't date too much in the beginning, but finally I, you know, I kind of went back to square one. I realized that was one of the reasons I kind of started this in the first place. So, you know, lo and behold, we've been married four years now. Oh, that's beautiful. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And what brought you to uh, go on to like CatholicSingles.com? Well, I had some uh, other friends who had success on online dating and they were giving me a little nudge. I was still single in my 40s. and. I was very nervous and then I decided, well, you know what, let me try it out. And um, I decided on a Catholic site because I thought it was very important for me to find somebody who shared my faith and put a little profile up, thought about it, uh, and lo and behold, um, <laughs> best $29.95 I ever spent, right? Something like that. Something like that. So it was a bargain. It was well, a bargain. Talk, in many ways, <laughs> right? In uh, many ways a bargain, right? <laughs> Well, I do want to ask this question because you mentioned that you know it took a nudge, right? A yes, little bit of yeah, a nudge definitely. to get you going in that direction. So dispel some of the myths about online dating, you know, or finding somebody online. Uh, lots of people have misconceptions about it. Some people do have a little bit of hesitancy and reluctance, like you experienced, Tricia. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think in the, in the early days when the, when this was starting to take off, people did have a lot of reservations mm -hmm. and. You know, a couple years into it, I think what, what happened was there was a lot more acceptance, people talking about it, it went kind of mainstream. You saw shows like Oprah and stuff highlighting, you know, couples that were meeting this way. And now I think the stats are somewhere one in three people meet online nowadays um, that end up in marriage. So it's, it's here to stay and it's definitely a much more accessible uh, form of meeting someone. And that's what it is. It's a tool to meet somebody. It doesn't replace a relationship. You're not don't think of a, having a pen pal relationship and think that's a relationship. Yeah. This is a tool to meet somebody physically. Let me ask you in relation to that, I mean, what most people think, and certainly in the early days, and we always hear horror stories out there once in a while, people saying, well, gee, how do I know that the person I'm talking to is really the person that sure. they're portraying themselves as? You know, uh, you were lucky because both of you turned out to be extremely honest. Yeah. But uh, and I'm sure it's you're real. very happy about that. You know, it took five right. dates before I let him pick me up at my house, right. and I, I right. met. Well, yeah. We we met in. Um, <laughs> it did. I didn't want him to know public where I lived yet. We like met that, in right? public places. Wow. We took our own cars. I met some of his friends and family. Um, in in that time, he met some of my friends. We kind of had a good feeling we were who we were saying we were. Yeah, and, and there's things you can do. Like she said, you want to use uh, precautions. You want to do things in the right, safe way. Meet in public places. Um, when you start networking with their friends and see those kind of things, um, the, relation, the relationship develops and just as it naturally would any other way. Um, the big, I think, uh, myth or, or uh, thing people get caught into is if they get into these relationships where they never do meet, you know, and you've heard about stories like that where they go on forever. I mean, those are little red flags. And, and on top of that, we actually do some, you know, filtering, some things that are uh, proprietary that we look for, and we can kind of sort through a lot of the stuff. But, you know, it takes the, um, uh, the common sense of a lot of people. And I think in your heart, you know, if you ever have one of those little uh, butterflies that go off and you're not sure about something, it's probably good to listen to your instincts. Exactly, yeah, right. definitely. Yeah, the gift of discernment is a good thing. Yeah. But it also occurs to me, too, that in, in the rapid pace world in which we live and people uh, are engaged in careers and things of this nature, the time, the, the opportunity is not always there. So this provides an opportunity to at least begin a process of not only meeting people but also maybe making a decision on, on what it is that you're looking for and, you know, uh, what is going to be most important to you in moving forward into a relationship. So it's kind yeah. of non-threatening in a certain sense. Well, yeah, and that's, I mean, our goal is to really kind of narrow the search down so that, I mean, most of the people that come to us, their primary goal or search criteria is to find someone who shares their faith. And as Catholics, we know that's very important. So we've already narrowed that down a bit and help them in the search process. And then, you know, we have 
some compatibility tests, lots of questions about your personality that we kind of go through. And you know, it, again, it's a process of discernment. You have to go through there and really, just like you would meet somebody in person for the first time, you know, and uh, the relationship develops from there. Services. We do have a chaplain for our site. You can write yeah. and ask him a question. Um, we have an apologetic section on our site as well. We're trying to give Catholic resources to our membership. So we're trying to build fellowship as well as the hope that you might meet somebody. Yeah, it's definitely a community. That's, you know. Now you mentioned that this is kind of here to stay, and, that, and it seems like in the tech world we're living in, it's going to become more than here to stay. It'll, it'll probably right, become right. a a priority way. Why has that changed? Why is it that people don't meet the way they used to? Maybe in the old days when Jeanette and I were <laughs> meeting our spouses, whether that was in high school or college or something, why is that not the pattern anymore? What's changed? I think it's a lot of things. I mean, you know, there, people, I mean, walk around and we see everybody with their cell phones and their smartphones. People are really reliant uh, or on this technology now, and they use it for a lot of social interaction that they might otherwise have, you know, done another way. Whether it was meeting, I mean, when we were younger, we didn't have these tools, and we didn't have internet and those kind of things. Um, it, it, this is culture is just gravitating that way, and I think having um, the smartphones and the, and the tools are great, but. Um, you know, and people are also meeting later in life to get married. That's another trend that, that we're seeing. Us. You get caught up in work. I think that's another thing. There are a yeah, lot more career-focused people now, yeah. and especially more women. And you're working 10 and 12 hours a day sometimes. Um, you're not, you don't have the luxury of meeting in a social um, place after work. You're going home and going to sleep. No, exactly. you're, you're moving out of your communities. More people, you, a lot of people, Back then, you'd meet somebody in your own neighborhood, the, the kids that you grew up with, and, and they married. And I have wonderful friends who met in grade school and high school and are still married, and, it, and it's great. But a lot of that's not happening because people are moving out of their towns, they're in a new city, they don't have that same community that they had, and they're, they're learning about people for the first time. And I, and I think because people are waiting longer, that dating pool, again, that I alluded to earlier, dwindles as they and the statistics are now that there are more single people in this country than ever before really? and they outnumber married so that's a big deal and i know that when you're in school and you're younger you've got more of the non-traditional or non-technical ways of meeting people we go into the the realm of being at home working all day your career is more important you're, you're putting off marriage these are now the tools that they're utilizing. And it's a lot better than the bar scene. Let's well, absolutely, right. yeah. So, I right. never went out, I right. mean, not that I never went to bar, but I rarely did. You know, I'd rather go to the movies and pizza with my friends, yes. so it, it was hard. And David lived an hour and a half away. I was going to ask you yeah, that, that question. Yes. You know, was, was, it, it sounds as though you had the opportunity to meet each other's families, and yeah. I think there's something to be said about seeing somebody in their social setting, in their family structure. Absolutely. You learn a lot from that, but you were an hour and a half away. What about these long distance kinds of things? That can be very difficult. I have a good example of that. My friends who encouraged me, they were, they were five hours away. I think it's five hours, Fresno and Los Angeles. Um, and they did it the right way. Um, when her husband came to visit her for the first time, he put himself up in a hotel. She met him at a public place. Even though he came from out of town, she didn't tell him where she lived or anything like that. The first time she went to Fresno, he put her up in a hotel and they went out and met his family for dinner. You just that security. Um, so, you know, some people will say, well, I'm out of town, I can't find a place to stay, things like that. If you're serious about somebody, you want their comfort level to be serious, too, and, and you do the correct steps, and you know what those are. So there are ways to do it to make it happen. We, we just um, met one of our members, she was in Brooklyn, he was in Canada. And oh, on, right. yes, and he flew in with a priest friend of his, and she took her mother to the airport to meet them. I mean, yeah. now that's a smart girl. She had a chaperone, and she did it right, you know. You know, and 
they're older, but it's still, you know, a, a wonderful thing. You gotta be smart. Yes. Yeah, no, yeah. Absolutely. Smart. Yeah. Okay, and your website is CatholicSingles.com, I'm assuming. <laughs> I, I guess we don't have to mention that since uh, we've got it here. Right, you're here at the Thank conference. You. It's Thanks. Much fun. <laughs> that's okay. That's wonderful. People need uh, all the help they can get these days, that's for sure. Thanks, David and Tricia. And we'll be back with more uh, with a special guest, a great friend of Mother Angelica and the networks for many, many years, Dr. Timothy O'Donnell from Christendom College. We're here at the World Meeting of Families at the Pennsylvania Convention Center right here in Philadelphia. Much more ahead. Stay with us. We are back here at the 8th World Media Families coming to you from Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Convention Center, joined on set by Jeanette Bankovic. And as I alluded to, a great friend of Mother Angelica for many, many years and of EW10, a loyal supporter and uh, show host to multiple series on the Sacred Heart, uh, the program you did uh, on Ireland, you, you did on Catholic Ireland as well. And it's great to have you here, Dr. Timothy O'Donnell from Front Royal, Virginia, Christendom College. Great to Thank have you, you here. It's great to be with both of you. A real honor. Now, we're here talking about families, and, you, and you've always been a pr big proponent of the whole concept of the domestic church, right? That's true. As a matter of fact, they asked me to speak on that. And domestic church is one of those concepts that was enshrined in the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, Familius Consortio by John Paul II. But it's one of those things, since the family is so important, like John Paul used to always say, the future of humanity passes through the family, that we've got to get family right. If we don't, Society's not going to be ordered right, and it'll even affect the church because the church is really founded upon the notion of family as a domestic church. And that's something that a lot of Catholics haven't really heard the term or not from it sounds sort of strange. But I think the idea behind it is for a lot of our brothers and sisters, they sort of think of like church is where you go to on Sunday. And that's sort of, you know, the focal point. And the church says the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the Christian life, but it doesn't exhaust the Christian life. So the idea that faith needs to be lived in the home as well. And so a concept like the domestic church means that mom, dad, and kids should really come together to be a praying community, that faith is not just something that you do on Sunday when you go to the parish, as important as that is, and that needs to be integrated into family life, but it should be a praying community. That's sort of the lifeblood of what it means to be a family, and that supernatural sense of faith should animate everything we do as families, the way we get together, the way we pray, the way we recreate, everything that we do. You know, when we talk about family today, it, it's, it's sad, isn't it, that we have to define what we mean by family. Yes. And when we talk about family, we're talking about a, a one man and one woman in an indissoluble union for life, the fruit of which is children, should God will it, and should the bodies agree, right? Absolutely. So when we think about that, we realize that, that the mother and the father, the man and the woman, play a fundamental role in this beautiful reality of not only the domestic church, but the way in which the domestic church is meant to influence and affect culture, Absolutely. society at large. Absolutely. Well, it's sort of like you need a manual when things aren't working right. I mean, everyone knew what basically what family and marriage was all about. And I think in a lot of sense, they still do. I mean, some of these things are written on the human heart. I remember with the Pontifical Council of the Family, a lot of times you get some of the legates and representatives from Africa and the Philippines saying, what's wrong with you people in America? I mean, don't you get it? This is obviously what this is for and what it's all about. But this is a great opportunity to really manifest something that is really beautiful. And the beauty of the family, when it's really lived, it's the greatest source of natural happiness. Our Lord elevated to the level of a sacrament. So recognizing that moms and dads have a key role to play, uh, complementing one another, supporting one another, but within the home uh, it's very important. And St. Paul taught all about that, you know, he's talking about relationship in the home, and sometimes people get a little upset, you know, like about wives be submissive to husbands, but everyone forgets that the first thing he says in Ephesians is be submissive to one another in the Lord. It's not about who's the boss, who's on top, you're there to help each other. 
bring in new life into the world and help those children and your spouse to get to heaven. So they complement each other. And it is a really beautiful, beautiful thing. Although sometimes you get those cynical jokes, you know, why did God give us the family so we don't have to fight with strangers? You know, <laughs> and, and so I mean, there's no such thing necessarily as the ideal family outside the holy family, but we all need to strive and work to try to imitate those great virtues that were communicated. Well, it's interesting too, because I was listening to Jeanette's question, it reminded me, you know, the nuclear family. When we were growing up, we always thought about the nuclear family. They've nuked the nuclear family, it seems like, what yes. we've got today. They've blown it up. Now, one of the things I was thinking about in the power of the family, you were talking about the domestic church and that concept, and the idea, as Mother said, with holy reminders, to get those into your homes, into your life, so you have those sacred pictures, you have the, the saints to remind yourself sure. what's going on, also your St. Benedict cross, let's say. Yeah. But one of the things I know that you were uh, very interested in, you did a series on the Sacred Heart, mm -hmm. and uh, the idea of enthroning your home Absolutely. to the Sacred Heart Absolutely. and things like that is a really powerful thing for a family, isn't it? Yeah, a it? lot of these popular devotions were just marks in Catholic home. You went to Catholic home, you sensed immediately images of the Sacred Heart, of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And you know, it's true, all knowledge comes through the senses. So we need to have those beautiful reminders in our homes for our children. But something like enthroning the Sacred Heart in the home is great because the ritual is so beautiful because there's blessings that the father and the mother bestow upon their children. And you can have a beautiful tradition, for example, something as simple as the morning offering. The family gets up before the day gets hectic, dad goes off to work, mom does what she needs to do. You gather together around the image of the Sacred Heart. You say a simple morning offering, offering all your prayers, works, joys, and sufferings. And then maybe if there's a, a soccer match or maybe there's something special going on in a kid's life, a test. Let's pray especially for Johnny or what would you like? And the kids see the parents praying together and you're praying with your children. And it really manifests your life as a domestic church that we really practice our faith and that Christ has headship over the family. And it can be a great witness to neighbors, uh, not only to your children, but others if you consecrate the home and invite other people in, you know, goodness is diffusive. And they say, well, that seems to really be a great idea. Praying with your kids, you know, and praying with one another and letting the children see that and then taking that and spreading that elsewhere in the neighborhood, you know, starting this sort of one heart at a time, heart speaking to heart. It's a great, great idea. Yes. And these make lasting impressions upon children. And it's one of the ways in which the children see the connection between what happens on Sunday and what happens in the home. It's a beautiful way for them to see the, the uh, uh, connection that they have personally with God himself, especially in that morning offering, as you're saying, oh, to remember uh, those occasions that populate a child's life. Oh, absolutely. Now, I remember in my own life, my dad praying with us after a full day work, coming up to make sure he said night prayers with us. And even the family rosary, we used to grumble because it was 6.30 in the morning, we get up. You know, I still find it very difficult to pray without coffee first. But you know, as a kid, you know, I guess you need orange juice. But just the memory that this was important, this was a special time set apart, and depending on what the rhythm of the family, trying to work in where you could get together, maybe to, to pray a rosary together, have quiet time, get the children involved, lighting candles, you know, bring out a statue of Blessed Mother, but recognizing that this is real, this is the part of the way we're meant to live, this is not just something that's sort of an add-on, right. this is the very air we breathe. And so the more the family becomes a praying, living community, then Sunday Mass, Sunday Eucharist becomes even even more significant and it all feeds into each other where you get that supernatural vision that can really help push back against some of the toxic elements in it culture. It becomes an extension of your actual daily life Absolutely. rather than a one-off thing you're doing once a week. Very and I think so. the thing I was thinking about, how much importance, and we've talked about this on the network and certainly even recently, authenticity. What are young yes. people yeah. looking for? Yeah. And so that's the thing. When they see their parents living that out in the family, in the home, then they see that out in public, they know this is authentic. Oh, this yeah. is faith. This isn't, gee, I see dad looking really pious at mass or mom yes. acting very pious at the rosary club, but boy, at home, things are much different. Yeah, and it yeah. seems in society, so many people feel like there's an image out there, it's being projected to me, but I can't trust that image. It's a virtual image. It's not really real. Authentic. Are you really real? Authenticity is absolutely essential. There's still the mystery of free will. So sometimes parents can start beating up on themselves. Why well, did everything? You might do everything right, and you still may have difficulty with the child. But a lot of times the child remembers if it's authentic and it's lived and it's done in a loving way. I remember some of my kids would say, Oh, we got to go to Mass today. No, you don't have to go to Mass. You get to go to Mass, you know? And so some of those things stick, come back to haunt them later in life. <laughs> but it's really true. No, they want to see that authenticity, and there's nothing 
nothing more powerful in terms of strengthening the family, including religious practice on the part of the child as adult, if when they see mom and dad, especially dad, praying together and seeing that this is really important because you need a mother and you need a father. And when both are praying, it has a profound impact on the child and the family. You know, I'm thinking uh, about a statement that you made earlier on about involving the children in some of the beautiful uh, devotional practices that we have, the lighting of candles, etc., we're incarnational beings. Yes. And I have noticed, I noticed this with my own children and now with my grands, they love this expression of devotion. They love to participate in things like lighting candles or May crownings or using the rosary beads. Now, all of that speaks very profoundly and it, it becomes something that's impressed upon the soul. Uh, you know, uh, the more senses we involve in an activity, Absolutely. the more that activity uh, impresses us. So and you stays get it with as a us. mother, and the yes. church as a mother has the same <laughs> sense. We need those type of things, and kids love to be participants and to help set up, and even things like, you know, putting on some Gregorian chant softly, yes. which now rose is a quiet time. Can I do that? Can I do that? And letting them really participate. Or if it's a, a special feast day, you know, take a child out special time with them for Mass, or you have a cake, and you let them make the cake for their Saints' Day, or something like that. But a lot of these things that are part of our traditional Catholic way of life, we kind of lost them, or Somehow they were sort of ridiculed, you know, during the chaos of the late 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. But you know, there was a lot of wisdom, and a lot of that I think needs to be brought back. And we need to look at new ways that we can also continue to live out our faith in our families. Right. I was thinking also you you were talking about you know the things you say, uh, go to mass versus you have to go to mass, and it's always amazing because you hear yourself back from your children, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, and so. If you're doing the right thing, you can be pleased later when you hear them repeating <laughs> yes. to their kids or to you something that you know, wow, she was actually listening when I said that. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. really took that in. Yeah. So we have to remember that too, that, yeah, that when we anything. are doing yeah. those kinds of things, we don't think they're paying attention because they're on their you know, device or whatever, but it doesn't mean they're multitasking. And part That's of it true. is hearing what you're saying in the background. Yeah. And they're always listening and they're always thinking and they're always judging, even when you don't think they are. And that's why doing the best you can. And again, there's no perfect family. All of us are fallen, we all struggle. But given it your best shot, kids are gonna see the authenticity that you mentioned. And if it doesn't happen right away, that's something that eventually will come back, especially with prayer and sacrifice. You emphasize the role of the father. You said, and especially dad a moment ago, seeing yes. mom and dad, especially dad participating. And I read a statistic recently was a high percentage of young people that ultimately held on to their faith and it was the witness of the father in homes where the father is practicing the faith. I, I forget what the stat was, but it right. was very high. Oh, there's a crisis in fatherhood right now. And you have this sort of tradition of machismo and things like that, and the man is not involved, or religion's a woman's thing. But anyone who knows the type of virtue and strength of care it takes to really practice the Catholic faith and to do that. But you know, kids, we have to keep going back because need a mom and they need a dad. Now, sometimes women are in an unfortunate situation, there's not a man, but we don't go on and say, oh, that's ideal, that's okay. That's a tragedy if a spouse should die or something like that. We recognize that. We need to uphold the ideal because kids need a mom and a dad. And if the two are united, especially because there is a male leadership role, there is a headship that's there that Pius XI spoke of, John Paul spoke, and Paul talked about. And as a matter of fact, instead of pushing it off to the to the woman or to the mother, well, you take care of that and say, no, you have an obligation to your wife to be of service to her and let your kids see that you really love your wife and you pray together and this is the most important thing in your life. Right. The spiritual headship of the father and the heart of the family, of course, coming to the mother. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Donnell. You, Doug, Always great, great to, to see you. you. Jeanette, great to and, see you. Uh, God unfortunately, bless we're you. out of time here in Philadelphia because we have so much happening with the papal visit. And you can stay right here on EWTN for more with Raymond Arroyo and his papal posse from Washington. I'm Doug Keck, and my co-host is Jeanette Bankovic. Thank you for joining us here on the World Meeting of Families, live from the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia. We'll be back. See you later.